Warm welcome to Stockholm, uh, to this Think 2030 dialogue. We're here right in the middle of the center of the center of Stockholm, uh, in this beautiful, actually quite original uh, conference uh, facility from the built in kind of typical Scandinavian 1940s modernist functional style that we enjoy very much. I hope you like this venue as well. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, distinguished guests, excellencies, it's my privilege to open the Think 2030 Dialogue of 23, which is associated with the Swedish Presidency of the European Council. Um, you should know the meeting now is being recorded and filmed, and we have photographs going on, so be aware of that. Um, we have um, a year, a time where we are in the European Union challenged by a very difficult range of forces that affect our path to sustainability. Um, we have challenges in security, our geopolitical relations, uh, we have flux in our approaches to innovation and competitiveness high energy prices, inflation and cost of living that are threatening the social cohesion and threatening the momentum for uh, the European transition to a more sustainable society. So Sweden has taken over this presidency in a very challenging time and a critical phase. During times of crisis, the EU has attempted now both during the pandemic and during the Ukraine war to keep momentum up for the European Green Deal and show that it is a viable strategy for European development also in the future. We think it's actually amazing that the European Green Deal is not only alive but still very much at the center of the European project today. And today's conference will explore what this means in different dimensions but also looking forward into next year, parliamentary elections, new commission, how can the European Green Deal continue in the next phase. And we will consider this from the perspective of the Swedish presidency, but also from the future presidencies of Spain and Belgium. Think 2030 Dialogue is a follow-up to a Think 2030 biannual conference that was held in France last year in Paris in July during the French presidency. Before that, there's been conferences in Berlin and Brussels. Um, we are based on, uh, we can go to the next slide, um, the conference and the content is driven by something called the Think Sustainable Europe Network. <clears throat> which is a network of European institutes and think tanks. Um, and we are um, one of the founding members, SEI, together with co-hosts today, uh, Institute of European Environmental Policy, that you will meet shortly. <clears throat> it was founded in 2019, and we've grown from five founding members to today uh, 15 members around the European Union. <clears throat> and we have assembled today both people from policy audiences around Europe uh, from the, this network of institutes and think tanks and of course many interested colleagues and partners within business, science and uh, civil society. Um, and with that I'd like to uh, say welcome again and I'd like particularly to welcome our co-hosts of today. Uh, so please come up to the stage. Uh, Anna Jöborn, Chief Executive Officer of MISTRA and Jöran von Sydow, director of CEPS, Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies, Johan Schillenstjerner, director general of FORMAS, and Ero Yrjökoskinen, executive director of IEEP, Institute of European Environmental Policy. So we have together organized this conference and uh, I'd like to thank you for your contributions. Uh, it's been a very wonderful process. Instead of having uh, long, boring opening speeches from all the co-hosts, I thought we could have a little chat and a couple of questions to you all. 
Uh, if I start with you, Anna. Mm -hmm. um, as as um, leader of Mistra, you are a research funder that is tasked to promote sustainability transitions, but also to promote um, competitiveness in Swedish uh, business and Swedish industry. Where do you see areas where Sweden and EU can enhance competitiveness and promote ambitious sustainability action uh, on climate and environment in the future? Mons, I, I think as you uh, started introducing the conference, I think the Green Deal is a good start because it's a, creating a platform for us to meet. And I think it's not only a question about Sweden, it's a question about Europe and the rest of the world. So I think we really need to collaborate, and that's why we are all here today. And I think that we need to be able to think long term uh, to handle these complex crises, triple crises, or even more crises at the same time. We need to be able to think long term and also act on the knowledge we already have. And that's why it's so important that we are here now. We actually use, we need to use our knowledge together. So I think that's, that's really key. Mistra is uh, kind of a special thing in Sweden that we're very lucky to have. <laughs> uh, a foundation with, which is uh, away from the government and is able to take long-term funding mm. decisions uh, that your board decides on. Mm. Normally you have a couple of calls per year and you fund large programs that will uh, hopefully last mm. for a long time. So can I ask what's on the horizon coming up mm -hmm. in the Mistra think tank? Mm -hmm. It's actually always a question, of course, and I think uh, the main point is that we always try to be brave. We try to be bold we try to be ahead of the curve. And at the moment, we have two programs here in one of the sessions, and that's Mistra Geopolitics, and we also have Mistra Food Future. This is examples of, of programs right now in our portfolio, and I think they, they, they actually match these criteria very well. At the moment, we also look at, as most of you, of course, to the energy transition. And then we need a lot of raw materials. So at the moment we have a call on that and addressing the issues of environment 50 years ahead of us. Are we creating new problems by acting too fast? I mean, we really need to handle these complex issues together, so that's our call out right now. But in the future, since we are a foundation, that's why we are here. We, are want, we want to listen to you. What are the big issues? What is the demand of new knowledge? Um, we are looking for new ideas. Okay. That's right. So come to, to us and, and discuss. Yeah. What is the next yeah. call from Mistra? Go see her in the break. <laughs> <laughs> Johan, uh, Director General of Pormas, a uh, quite large research funder and policy agency here. Um, what do you see are are the EU green policy challenges that you think need more research funding? I think you summarized it quite well in the beginning, uh, Mons, when you did sort of mention all the different challenges we have in terms of sustainability and how they obviously are, are interconnected. And as you say, I mean, we, we are considered quite often to be a funder more in the environmental sphere, the sort of green, the green areas. And I think that this exactly is one of the challenges that we have ahead of us where we need more research funding. I mean, that's the systems approach, really, of course. How, would you, how do we connect the whole EU green transition that you mentioned is still driving a lot of the vision of the EU, where we want to go, with broader development, the broader development agenda? And that is also linked to the whole issue now of acceptance, the speed of implementation that everybody talks about, impact research, what actually works, how do we make sure that research results are actually also really being communicated into society. I mean, this is SEI's, of course, core, the science policy. So that is one critical area. But I also would like to s stress that we need also deep research, basic research. That's essential as well, because we know that the impacts of the transition, 
Uh, you talked about it also, mm. we should not create new, new challenges. That will have impacts on a lot of different systems. So we have to understand what the impact will be on natural resources in Europe and elsewhere. And this is, of course, very critical right now in Sweden. But also in terms of policy and management, but also business models. We have business here. And we see a rapid development of business models. And I, I would argue that we also need more research there as well. And then the third area that I would like to stress that we work quite a lot with is the interacting governance levels. I mean, we talk a lot about the EU Green Deal, but in the end, the implementation is quite local. And we see that from formats as a critical area. How do we connect the local level management or policy, which, you know, really at the, at the municipality level, with the regional, national, EU level, and also understand the global flows and the global uh, level of, of governance. So these are three areas where I think we need much more research, bo both deep research, but also understanding impacts and interactions. That's uh, good to hear. We had a, a network meeting yesterday. We talked yeah. a lot about the widening, we think, widening implementation gap. The European Union is full momentum with regulation, legislation, and the packages of the Green Deal. It's mind-blowing and probably overwhelming for the ministries, but the implementation, what's going on on the ground, what's mm -hmm. stopping action, what's driving action, that we don't know enough. Mm. Um, thank you very much. Um, do, you, do you feel that research plays a role now in the Swedish presidency? I think it does. I mean, it's always difficult to exactly monitor and assess. I know that Formas and I know that other research funders are uh, active uh, in various processes linked to the presidency. I know you are very active. So, I mean, this conference is an example, both where um, I think we are directly invited. We, ha we have a lot of examples of that to different processes, but also where we take the opportunity as a research community. It's not just waiting for us to be invited, but also to be, to be proactive. What I hope, however, is that we also in Sweden are open to maybe learn from the European Union, from the governance processes that are driven through the Green Deal, how science can be informing policy making. I think we in Sweden have a lot to learn from Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it's, it's an interesting example where we now are in all these crises where I sometimes can feel that uh, sort of national level politics and policy is struggling uh, to keep the long-term vision while we can see that the Commission and EU has managed to do so through the crisis. And I think that this is partly based on a firm sort of scientific platform that they can do so. They can argue and, and demonstrate that this is the right way forward. So we can learn also. We shouldn't forget that from, from Europe. Yeah. As well. Thank you. It's interesting. Now, going to Europe uh, more broadly, of course, uh, CEPs, um, Jöran, that you're a director of, um, you're a research institute on European policy more broadly, not just on sustainability and so on. Um, what, what are you focusing on that have uh, sort of connections to the Green Deal or sustainability uh, policies? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, Mons, for having us here as partners as well. It's a great privilege for us, being a small institute, primarily dealing with general issues of European affairs, European politics. But, of course, we also have a uh, specialist, uh, specialist in, in this area. But I would say that one reflection that connects a little bit to what you once said earlier, I think what's, what we see is also the extent of both leadership and organization at the European level which I think is quite important that the Commission has provided in putting up this big platform and also keeping up the momentum and pace of it. So that's one of the areas. Normally we study the institutional and political developments of the EU. The second part of that is that what I think is quite interesting in this broader field is the sort of issue, the, the placement of different issues alongside each other. And we see that with the Green Deal or rather the, or some of these horizontal takes on various policy domains and the new linkages. And right now we are focusing quite a bit on, the, let's say, the green industrial policies that we think are quite interesting how you mix. The second element of that kind of new mix is that the dimensions of external and internal policies are increasingly 
interlinked. So you see very much how also so many of the green policies, but also other they inf impact on each other. So most recent example would be, for instance, the European response to the Inflation Reduction Act, or indeed the geopolitical conditions in which Europe tries to respond. So I think these are a few strands, but I would also, a final point where I also connect a bit to you, and I think it's quite important to see that Europe, while leadership is provided at the European level in, in, from Brussels, it's still, what we have seen at least, there are some heterogeneity within the EU. It's a, it's a union of 27. Mm. There's a preconditions for the member states' capacity to actually do this. That really differs, and that we have invested some time in recently. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts around, um, of course, you are on the national news uh, every week. Uh, talking about Fortunately this, not. Ukraine uh, <laughs> war, yes. how is it affecting the current policy making uh, yeah. within during the Swedish yeah. presidency and connecting to environmental policy as you see it? Quite a bit, of course, and we know that, generally speaking, crises, when they occur, they normally create the momentum to move forward in policy areas where it was previously a bit stuck. So you see that advancement, particularly in the field of security policies, of course, in defense, etc. But what's striking to me, and you mentioned it as well before, is that through the last couple of crises, the COVID, pan COVID pandemic and now the aftermath of the Russian invasion, actually the pace has been kept up when it comes to the green transition. Mm -hmm. And that's quite in interesting as a general reflection on how the EU can operate also in various, at various places simultaneously. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. And now I'd like to last turn to um, Eero. Um, you recently took over as executive director of the coordinating group for our network, IEEP. Also, of course, National Finland, which I think is uh, the best neighbor uh, any country can wish for. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, with your organization, you're, right, you're in Brussels and you're quite close to, to engaging with the Commission. What do you see are the key challenges in, in kind of confronting the EU when we need to advance the European Green Deal this year? Um, are there things that are close to being finalized and wrapped up and ready to go? And what do we need to do? What, what, are, what are the problems that, that we need more time to solve in, in your perspective? Well, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us here as well. Uh, I think uh, Joran rightly mentioned uh, the impacts of the Ukraine war, and uh, I think that has been a catalyzer in a way in discussions both at member state level but also in Brussels. We all know uh, that costs of living have increased mm -hmm. in the member states. It has affected uh, a general attitude towards the Green Deal, which is a challenge at the moment. So uh, I sincerely believe that uh, we need to proceed in that direction, but also make sure that uh, the implement implementation gap that you mentioned months earlier uh, is, uh, is taken care of. But uh, the, the main challenge is, uh, at the moment, uh, clearly these populist movements. Mm. Coming from Finland, we recently had our parliamentary elections there, and uh, you all know that uh, the true Finns gained their historic uh, success, and they will most probably join the government uh, for the next four years, which might have an impact also on uh, the Finnish attitude towards uh, you know, promoting environmental issues at the European level. Uh, obviously, uh, IEP uh, will continue uh, its efforts in, uh, in providing new ideas in uh, how to uh, find solutions to the most uh, pressing problems, but uh, it will have an impact if at the European level uh, next year, after the European elections, uh, we will have a similar uh, counter reaction, let's say, mm -hmm. and thereby it, you know, the, the representation not only at the European Parliament but obviously also within the Commission might change. So we will see. Uh, we definitely hope that uh, the impetus to continue to promote the European Green Deal will not uh, end uh, with uh, the current uh, uh, Commission, 
uh, we see that the next decade is the decisive one if we intend to achieve uh, low carbon uh, circular economy at European level. But all this requires constant activities in that direction, and uh, that's what IEP is working for. Thank you, Eero. Um, and we will be able to uh, enjoy listening to your remarks also at the end of, end of today, yeah. in your final remarks. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, ask that we give a hand to our co-hosts and uh, that we can <laughs> then... Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> and I, I'd like now to hand over to our today's uh, moderators. Um, Niendo and Rob, my colleagues from SEI, who will uh, facilitate the coming session. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mons. Thank, Thank you for that you powerful, much. very insightful conversation on navigating crisis um, in sustainability. My name is Niendo Mashua. I'm a communications officer at SEI, and I have the one honor and privilege of introducing and welcoming Daniel Veslian, the State Secretary to the Swedish Minister for Climate and Environment. He'll be speaking to us about the agenda for the Swedish Presidency of the Council of the EU and ways forward for sustainability in the EU. And he's also fresh from the informal meeting of environment ministers in the EU, so we're hoping he can give us a little snippet of what they discussed. Thank you. Let's hope so. Distinguished participants, dear colleagues, good morning. I am Daniel Westlian. I'm, uh, as you heard, the State Secretary to uh, our Climate Minister, Romina Pormoktari. Uh, first, I would want to thank you for inviting us, me and uh, the Minister, to come here to speak today. Um, I think the, the platform is an important arena for discussions between policymakers, research institute, business actors, think tanks and NGOs. I really value this opportunity for me to briefly discuss here in front of you the priorities and the work of the Swedish Presidency so far and reflect on the outcomes of the informal ministerial meeting that we just held, as we heard, uh, this week, Tuesday and Wednesday. So uh, you will see me here today with the Presidency hat on, though uh, I guess we can also discuss what the government has, the government's position, but still I want to report a little bit from the Presidency. I hear the theme of the, uh, of the conference today is navigating crisis through sustainability. Both the EU and the rest of the world have had to focus on crisis management for quite some time now. We had the Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, and then we had the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, changed the lives for all of us. And, but we managed to get through it, uh, through it together. But just as COVID was almost coming to an end, Russia invaded Ukraine and created a security crisis with um, historic proportions. We in the European Union haven't had to endure the same direct and tragic effects on, of the invasion of, as our Ukrainian friends have. Nevertheless, this is also our crisis. The war has forced us to deal with a broad range of consequences, not the least skyrocketing energy prices and as we still struggle with general inflation. At the same time, we're facing a triple planetary crisis. The issues of climate change, biodiversity loss have, and pollution have devastating effects on our environment and on our health. Without question, our presidency takes place in a turbulent time. We are now more than halfway through the presidency. As you know, they are for six months. We entered uh, the presidency the 1st of January. I'm happy to say that we are on track on delivering on our four overarching priorities. That is security, the green transition, competitiveness and the rule of law. The single most important issue for us, obviously, is supporting Ukraine in their defense against the Russian aggression. In only 12 months, EU member states have managed to reach consensus on 10 sanction packages against Russia. Uh, where we have uh, united in, in unity. We have also made an historic agreement 
to jointly procure and provide Ukraine with ammunition. This is a great achievement and a testament to the Union's strong support to Ukraine in these uh, difficult times. Some people, I guess among them Putin, didn't think that Europe would stand united. But we are, and we are united, and we will keep being united in supporting Ukraine. The aim of our presidency is to make the EU greener, safer and freer. These matters are not isolated, but deeply intertwined. If we accelerate the green transition, we do not only reach our climate and environmental targets, but we will also increase our security, our competitiveness and our European autonomy. Uh, I said if we accelerate. Um, we have shown really good progress, which I will come to, but I would rather want to change that to when we accelerate the transition, because there is still a need for further accelerating uh, the work. The green, uh, th this is why the green transition is one of Sweden's overarching presidency priorities and why we are committed to delivering on the objectives of the European Green Deal. Much work remains, but we have already achieved a lot during these first three months. This may be a long list, and if you get bored of listening to it, just wave your hand and I will shorten it. But just to mention what we have uh, been working on. Of course, uh, one of our main priorities is to finalize the remaining files of the Fit for 55 package, which, as you know, aim to ensure that the EU reduces its net emissions by at least 55% by 2030, as compared to 2005. A lot of progress was achieved already by the previous Czech presidency, but we have managed to take important steps forward this spring. Since the beginning of March, preliminary agreements have been reached on the energy efficiency uh, directive, sustainable maritime fuels, alternative fuels infrastructure, and on the renewable energy directive. In addition, the presidency achieved a council mandate on the gas package, which is a big step forward towards shifting uh, away from natural gas to renewable and low carbon, carbon gases. The Fit for 55 package truly represents a landmark in the implementation of the EU's climate ambition. And I want to repeat that. This is really a landmark. This is a great achievement of the European Union and its member states and institutions. Another milestone so far is that the environment ministers agreed on common position on the industrial emissions directive uh, the 16th of March in the Environmental Council. This directive regulates pollutant emissions from industrial installations and from livestock farms. We have also made significant progress on other important acts uh, of the Green Deal, among them the nature restoration law, the files of the zero pollution package, the packaging and packaging waste direct, uh, regulation, and the certification framework for carbon removals, just to mention a few. Uh, yeah, as I told you, it was about to be a list. I would also like to say a few words about the international negotiations that are important to securing future sustainability and resilience, both within Europe but also overseas. In these negotiations, the EU must lead by example and ensure uh, that we deliver on our targets. As concerns the climate, the EU has consolidated its role as the global climate leader with uh, the increased 2030 targets and the adoption of the Fit for 55 package taking us to our 2030 target. We need to show that we all rally behind this ambition, also in time of simultaneous crisis in Europe. And I'm really proud to say that I think we have. We have been able to rally behind the need for action on climate despite the crisis we have experienced. The COP28 meeting in December will of course be important, as it will be the first global stock take of the Paris Agreement. Another global priority is to stop the loss of biodiversity. Last December the world agreed on a historic package of measures to address the ongoing loss and restore ecosystems. The agreement, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, was, uh, was reached there in December. Already at uh, COP16, that's the COP of the Biodiversity Convention. Next year, all parties need to report on how the framework is implemented and how action is actually taken on the ground. Now is the time for us to step up and to get to the implementation phase. 
And in a month's time, the world will gather in Paris again for a second meeting to negotiate the new internationally binding instrument to end plastic pollution. This is a, another worldwide uh, agreement on a, on, on a pressing uh, environmental matter, this time plastics and plastics pollution, which um, where the aim is to, to reach a, ne a negotiated um, agreement in just two years, which is, uh, for those of you who have been involved in such negotiations, a very short time. Anyway, second meeting will be in Paris now in May. Uh, the or, uh, European Union is already a front runner in this field and has a responsibility, of course, to contribute to the negotiations with solutions. For the second half of our presidency, our ambition is to keep progressing and to reach as far as possible on the important negotiations that still are ongoing and that the environmental ministers have on the table. Uh, with the right framework in place, the EU and its um, uh, companies can deliver on the objectives of the Green Deal. It is my firm belief that the targets can only be achieved through a co collaboration between member states, the European institutions and the private sector. After all, the change is performed by... Its, it happens through decisions at kitchen tables and in boardrooms. Uh, Politics can support that by deciding things in Brussels and in Stockholm and in the other capitals. But the change has to happen through individual decisions in households and in companies. That's where the actual reductions in emissions happen and that's where the changes take place that lead to improvements for the biodiversity. This brings me to my second point. I was asked to make some reflections from the informal ministerial meeting that took pl uh, place here in Stockholm this week. To this meeting, we did not only invite the environmental minister, which is the standard procedure, we, but we also asked them to bring a business representative from a front-runner company in terms of green transition. We spent two days reflecting and discussing competitive sustainability, where we asked ourselves how we can build on the knowledge and innovation power by European green front-runners, and uh, what we can do as policymakers to reward and further stimulate businesses to contribute to fighting climate change, preserving and restoring biodiversity and reducing pollution while closing material loops. The discussions during the meetings were fruitful and interesting. We talked about first-hand experience of preconditions, bottlenecks, challenges, driving forces and executive, uh, effective models for cooperation between policymakers and businesses. Now it seems like I'm reading from a card and that this was written in advance, uh, but I can assure you that I was there at the meeting and we wrote this after the meeting. So. <laughs> Throughout the meeting I uh, noted a sense of urgency and, I will, um, and a will to increase ambition. The input from companies and legislators focused mainly on creating economic incentives for circular materials and products, how to ac access uh, to skills uh, and knowledge, is a uh, current bottleneck uh, for uh, especially innovation. And that infrastructure is one of the key factors for the green transition and to increase the resilience of our societies. The invited delegates further raised that we need efficient permitting procedures and development of effective policies without lowering environmental standards. Collaboration and transparency of data is key along with the whole life cycle from manufacturers to recyclers and that public-private partnership can help realize this. I guess most of this was not unknown to the ministers and my uh, fellow state secretaries that attended the meeting, but still it was very important for us to hear this from the people that actually do the sh uh, perform the change by their, uh, their actions within their businesses and it was very hard, uh, interesting for us to get these real-life examples, but also to get a chance to discuss how the solutions could be um, achieved. If we, as policy makers, enable for our businesses to accelerate the, uh, the green transition by providing the right regulatory framework, it will help strengthen Europe's competitiveness in the longer run. Early movers will have an, a competitive edge in periods of industrial and technological transition. This we can see clearly all over Europe and maybe especially in Sweden where there are many examples of this. 
European companies that provide green solutions will be in high global demand and can help drive the transition towards the circular economy. As I started off here a while ago, um, some 10 minutes ago, Europe has focused on emergency measures for a long period of time, but one, uh, put one fire out after the other. But now is the time to build a stronger Europe with a green, robust and future-proof economy that can spur uh, prosperity for future generations. We must return Europe to its position at the forefront and ensure that we don't lag behind our partners in competitiveness and productivity. I would claim that is a prerequisite for the green transition. The Swedish presidency has put the issue of long-term competitiveness on the top of the EU agenda since day one. And I'm therefore very happy that the Commission, in mid-March, delivered a strategy to boost competitiveness beyond 2030. This strategy addresses a wide range of areas and has a set of key performance indicators to measure the progress. This cannot be described as anything else than a breakthrough. Finally, we're back to discussing one of the reasons we have the European Union in the first place. Obviously, peace is the fundament, and then uh, working together to increase European competitiveness is a very important part of this project that we haven't been talking about enough in recent years. To conclude, we cannot predict the future, nor what challenges awaits us, um, or uh, what lies ahead of us. But we can build a stronger, greener and more competitive Europe to help future generations meet the challenges that we can still not foresee. I'm looking forward to the discussions that are going to be held here today, uh, which I'm sure will provide us with valuable insights and perspectives for our common work ahead. With that, I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, very succinct remarks. I, it would be unfair of me to release you without asking you this one question. Okay. You've talked about green transition specifically for the EU, but how can we, um, what is needed to ensure other parts of the world can also pursue sustainability efforts that are needed to gain access to the EU markets? You know, maybe this is the most important question of them all. Uh, we tend to, here in Europe, we tend to have a European perspective. We think that the green transition in Europe is demanding, and it sure is. We uh, think that reaching the climate goals is uh, tough and that we have to increase competitiveness to achieve that, uh, which is also true. Uh, but then again, when it comes to, um, when you take a step back, you can realize that Europe is probably the region in the world with the best chances of achieving the climate goals in time and where we have a chance of uh, protecting nature, preserving and restoring uh, areas that have been destroy destroyed previously. It may be America can also uh, reach the climate goals. They are making a good progress. But sometimes we tend to forget the rest of the world in this discussion. And obviously, as we know, especially for climate, the, we cannot solve the problem without everybody getting along. Uh, reaching all the way to zero is difficult. It means that everybody, everywhere, in every country has to do everything. We cannot leave any fossil fuels, uh, any f use of fossil fuels. We have to leave it all in the ground. So uh, it means that we have to perform, we have to make this change everywhere. Uh, I think the main, the main tool for the European Union to achieve this is through its trade agreements where we can, through giving, uh, giving some carrots and uh, putting up some requirements for entering deals, we can, uh, we can uh, explain our views and we can get people interested in following the same direction with the carrot of the trade agreement. And this has been quite productive in in there are several examples of how this has been achieved and that there has been a change in other countries. Um, there are some, uh, some recent examples. The Coalition of the Trade Ministers for Climate reached in, uh, in Davos, where uh, European Union, Ecuador, Kenya and New Zealand uh, launched, launched this initiative to, to make trade a better tool for, for climate uh, change 
or for <laughs> mitigating climate change. Um, I would also want to mention uh, the extensive aid from the European Union, which also has a strong climate focus, uh, and where, which is also connected to trade. The aid for trade uh, um, initiative, which um, is um, intended to make it more, uh, make developing countries more involved in global trade. Uh, we know that global trade makes all of us, us better off. Uh, we live better lives when we collaborate with each other. And trade is a perfect example of, of collaboration between, between people. Finally, I think the carbon border adjustments being set up by the European Union may help. They may also lead to well, um, disagreements since they can be seen as, um, as uh, customs. Now, uh, the, the, the really good effect that we already see from the com coming introduction of the carbon border adjustments, where we put a price basically on carbon content of imported uh, products of so in, some, uh, in some categories, cement, steel, electricity, uh, fertilizer, and so on. Uh, we, uh, we put a price when importing from parts of the world that do not have a price on carbon dioxide comparable to the Europe European Union. Uh, the first uh, thing that happens is that countries put up their own systems for pricing carbon, which is obviously what the European Union wanted. It's better for other uh, countries outside of the Euro Union to tax carbon emissions themselves than to let the European un Union tax them at the border. So I think that's uh, already making an effect, and, and I expect that to increase when, as we go along. Mm. Great. So incentivizing through trade. Uh, yeah, in yeah. different ways, and also through aid, but uh, most of all through trade, I would say. Okay. Just, that would be a shorter way to, to say what I asked. Yes, and more Trades. efficient. <laughs> and I'm happy to hear my home country, Kenya, being mentioned in there. So we're making good progress. <laughs> Another round of applause for Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I want to invite my able co-moderator, Rob, to take us through the next session. Thank you very much, Ingendo. Thank you again to uh, State Secretary Vestlian. Um, I'm going to beg the patience of our online audience for a moment. And we're going to do a little Swedish lesson for those in the room, uh, which I'm sure you weren't expecting. Um, I understand some people are looking to under, uh, get onto Wi-Fi and not sure how to do so. The Wi-Fi... A network is Bigget Wi-Fi, and here comes the Swedish lesson. The uh, password is Konferens, spelt in the Swedish way, which means it starts with a K, ends with an S, and doesn't have an E on the end. So it's K, and that's a capital K, O-N-F-E-R-N-S. Okay. Wonderful. Now, it's really my great pleasure uh, to invite a, a policy panel up on stage now, uh, and I think I can spy them over there in the corner. So why don't you come up, please, uh, my wonderful policy panel. Uh, Janusz Potocznik, uh, who is former uh, commissioner uh, and now the co-chair of the International Resource Panel. Uh, Norbert Kurilla, who is senior advisor to the Slovakian president on the green transition. And Claudia Hahn from the European Commission. Uh, responsible for uh, strategy. Claudia, you should be in the middle. Yeah, somewhere around here. These these three look good, and I'll put myself on this. Okay, I'll put myself Oops. on this, Jelen. It's okay. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Uh, welcome all three of you um, uh, to to this policy panel. Um, we've just been hearing um, from the state secretary, who talked about and listed up a, a whole range of different crises, recent, but also he referred to. A triple planetary crisis, something, a, a term actually that I've heard um, the UN Secretary General use. And he, he talks about, of course, the climate emergency, he talks about ecological degradation, and he talks about the, the uh, growing waves of pollution. And I want to turn to you, Claudia, first of all. And thinking about this, these poly crises, uh, the word of the moment, um, I'm just wondering how, how is the Commission, or how has the Commission been trying to respond? to this triple planetary crisis? With the European Green Deal. <laughs> <laughs> so we can stop here. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I think uh, the Commission was very ambitious in 2019 in putting forward uh, the European Green Deal. Um, it is sure that the overall context in 2018-19 was very, uh, it helped having the European Green Deal. We had just left the financial crisis behind us, COVID was not yet seen, um, the economy, economy was recovering, so it was really uh, a period which was um, favourable to have long-term thinking instead of short-term urgencies. Um, the previous commission had already obviously <laughs> worked with, uh, with uh, environment, but it was still a, a strong focus on both uh, circular economy and CO2 reduction. Still, sometimes we forget, for me, my personal, the moment where I thought, okay, now we have changed something, is the plastic strategy. I think it's the first time that the Commission dared saying, stop using this. So it was those 10 plastic items found on the European beaches. And my personal impression was, okay, now we tell people what they are not allowed to do anymore. We prohibit children from having balloons for their birthday parties. It means we are getting serious. And for me, it was the first sign of getting to sufficiency. Then there's something we should not underestimate, and I always tell it to my children, the effect of the Fridays for Future movements. Uh, my children always tell me why nobody cares about it. I can tell you I saw commissioners, not the green ones, I saw their faces when there was a climate uh, march in Brussels on Rue de la Loire and it had an impact. They had not expected this. Um, and the European elections obviously with the, with the green. So. And another point, the SDGs were very high on the agenda in 2018. We don't speak so much about them in Europe at the moment, uh, but on 2018-19 they were very high on the agenda. We had prepared the AIDS Environment Action Programme and it was full of systemic transition. The European Agency had really started to look into systemic transition, not only environment policy. So all this made that in 2019 it was a Green Deal, which is somehow an SDG strategy. Not everything is covered. It's not about uh, inequalities, the gender inequalities. Obviously, there are things missing, but it's, it's, it's a systemic approach to, to the change we need. Is this, does this reply to you? No, this is a brilliant, and I'm, I think it's useful to have our minds cast back to the period in, in 2018 uh, and 2019 uh, when, when there was this uh, possibility, as you say, to, to think long term. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's worth, worthwhile since we've been through so many uh, crises in the meantime. And a lot of firefighting has been, been uh, undertaken. I, I want to turn now to, to Norbert, if I can, because, um, I mean, as part of the, the more recent set of firefighting emergency measures, um, there's been an opportunity for member states to put together national recovery and resilience plans. So again, here we're, we're talking about measures to actually deal with current crises, the emergencies that are, are need to be addressed now. And Slovakia uh, has put to, uh, forward its own national recovery and resilience plan. And it's really ambitious when it comes to its green investments and policy. Norbert, can you tell us a little bit about the priorities that has been set by Slovakia and why you chose those priorities for this National Recovery and Resilience Plan? Yeah, thank you very much and thanks for having me here. I'm happy to, to be able to participate and uh, happy to contribute. So coming uh, to, to the main question and how we designed a, a National Recovery and Resilience Plan, it was of course uh, in response to um, to make to make sure that the sustainability is is very much embraced uh, in, in in the endeavor of, of the government. So just for information, we, we put aside roughly 43 percent out of the total envelope uh, towards the green uh, measures, green um, also accompanied by by strong reforms, and around 20 percent to digital. So being um, the sort of also even the front runner in terms of how much uh, money we have allocated to the, to the green, green policies. And if I would be more uh, specific, uh, coming from Central Europe, uh, we have also a very strong legacy of very inefficient building stocks and, and old houses. So obviously very strong focus one was on the retrofit retrofit retrofitting, retrofitting of, of houses and focusing on energy efficiency gains. I think um, even almost half of this uh, envelope was, was uh, towards um, upgrading the, the buildings in, in wider sense and going more 
sustainably, uh, so not only targeting the energy per se, but, the, but wider, uh, wider elements. Uh, another area, uh, since we are a very mm, industrialized country, I think uh, the second in Europe after the Czech Republic, so we, very, we have also very high share of energy intensive industries, mm. So we put a very solid envelope uh, in, in modernizing the energy efficient industries, decarbonizing and, and putting a, a framework to, 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 to make them more competitive. Uh, and third area is, is the area of clean transport. Uh, Slovakia is, is an automotive superpower producing the most cars in the world per capita, by the way. Uh, but we are still lagging behind on, on, on new types of, uh, you know, uh, uh, transport that is very much electrified, so lots of investments is coming to the charging stations uh, and also upgrading the fleets uh, and, and as well to the railways. Uh, so I think these are the three main areas and in combination with digital, I think green and digital is, is the, the headlines of our recovery plan, so hopefully we, we can deliver on that and once we have also a very robust uh, legislative framework behind that, I think we can be successful at the end of the day. And these priorities, they, they were the ones that matched the, if you like, the imperative that you were facing with the energy crisis. This was the, these were the ones that really mattered um, to deal with that. Is that, is that the...? Um, no, this is actually coming already now, uh, since a uh, very strong new chapter um, um, is being now uh, put in place, um, basically targeting the energy, energy crisis. Um, so mm, this is now based on, on, of course, the situation in Slovakia as at the, uh, as at the front line of, of war, uh, which is happening in Ukraine. So we were severely hit uh, by, by these circumstances and by these aggressions. Uh, but now um, we are having, as I said, new chapter that is helping diversifying, that is helping uh, changing uh, energy mix, promoting renewables, especially in the heating sector and making um, our economy more resilient also in mm. terms of um, energy. Mm. Thank you very much, Norbert. Janesh, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a phrase that one should never let a crisis go to waste. Do you think that we're letting this poly crisis go to waste, or are we making the best use of it? Thank you, Rob, and first, thanks for the invitation. Uh, Actually, I'm absolutely convinced that we are not doing enough. In a way, we are not seriously dealing with the system transformation which is needed, economic transformation. And uh, I, I tend to use sometimes the phrase, if uh, you want to protect the elephants in nature, you first need to extinct the elephants in the room. And uh, we haven't yet even started with that, to be honest because the major elephant in the room which we have is uh, uh, who is surpassing planetary boundaries, who, who is overshooting the planetary boundaries, who is consuming too much. And actually it's not so much about the consumption itself, it's the wastefulness of the economic model which delivers these human needs. And that's where it's the problem. So we have created an economic system in which it's simply um, economically attractive if you use more and more resources and destroy nature. And this will not end up well. And if we will not ask that question, by the way, also in the, in the whole story of the climate negotiations, there is nothing about sufficiency, which you mentioned, or there is nothing about how to limit the consumption or how to limit the use of those resources over consumption, which is naturally connected to high-income countries. So, uh, as long as we are, uh, what, as, if I give you an example, as long as we are stuck to that in all those talks, how to clean up the steel industry, and it is extremely important to clean it up, but not ask the question in the first place, how much of that steel is actually used for underutilized cars, for empty houses, practically not used for meeting the human needs, then we are starting the, the whole economic story at the end. So I think there are, if you would allow me, there are four fundamental shifts which I see are necessary if we are 
actually serious to start talking about implementing the European Green Deal. We would need to shift from considering humans being in function of economic success, measured in a simplified measure of GDP, to an economy which will be again in function of meeting human needs in the most resource-efficient way. So that's the first thing which we need to do. Second, we need to start uh, looking at us humans not as external and uh, the one who are actually uh, managing the nature, but as part of nature. So destroying nature is simply destroying ourselves because we are part of nature. Third, we need to move from a production resource intensive based system to a creative system, which will not reward those who are using more resources, but rather those who are in a creative ways delivering human needs by using less resources. And finally, uh, we, we desperately need to change the governance system. Uh, we are actually the first generation on this planet which is living in socio-ecological space of planetary scope. And all those crises you mentioned at the beginning uh, are actually the crisis of our generation. So uh, I don't know if you know how much was the population when the Club of Rome released the uh, limits of growth. That was 1972. 3.8 billion. Now it's over eight. So this is 50 years. If we think that the world is the same, come on, wake up. So all the governance systems which we have created in that world are not there and fitting for purpose to answer the questions of this new world. Mm -hmm. So basically, there are only two avenues. Either we wake up and start cooperating and uh, trying to find answers together, mm -hmm. including the whole economic uh, story and sustainability story, uh, my point is basically that the whole environmental transition is actually the story about will we secure peace, will we secure uh, uh, human, normal human relations in the future. It's not only an environmental story. Those who understand it in that way are simply living in the world which is not existing. So the world has changed. Remember that and accept that and we need to accommodate to that, or the world will accommodate us, because this is the second option, which is not a good option. Thank you. Thank you, Janusz. It's a reality check, and four very clear, broad, but clear tasks ahead of us. Um, I want us to, to, I want to sort of make sure we mark down that the word sufficiency has been mentioned by both Claudia and Janesh here. And the, I think there's a conversation that we can come back to around contrasting sufficiency with competitiveness. So let's, let's put that in the back of our minds. But I actually want to pick up the, the, the word you mentioned as well, which is implementation, which came up in our opening panel, and the importance of the Green Deal also being about implementation and getting it done and making a real change. Mm -hmm. And I, I, if I can turn to, to Claudia, I mean, Claudia, the Green Deal has the most incredibly ambitious set of goals about being net zero uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, decoupling resource use and economic growth. There are social goals in there as well. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about where you know, the Commission sees the Green Deal? Are we, are we still on a conveyor belt of more proposals coming out, or is, is it a matter of implementation? If it's a matter of implementation, what are the challenges to getting things done on the ground that you see? Yes, a uh, very good question. Um, I'm in DG Environment, and I think like my colleagues in DG Klima, DG Energy, I'm not sure we even have time to think of all will this be implemented because we are so busy on delivering, because we see this window <laughs> of a political opportunity, and I think the, the Commission President, Vice President, they really want to use as long as the Green Deal is alive, we don't know what comes next. One thing is sure, the next mandate will be more complicated than this one. So we continue to deliver. The Swedish presidents have said they are very busy. We are, busy. Uh, we are making many new, very systemic 
transposals even in 2023. We will have a soil health law, which has been tried for decades. It has never worked. Uh, there will be something on release on microplastics. Um, th there's still um, a lot of ambitious proposals reach uh, will, be, will come this year. So um, perhaps we are not yet really thinking on how we make this happen, but it's clearly that the, the more uh, targets we set ourselves, the more the implementation gap is increasing. We have infringement proceedings against several all member states in some areas, and some of these infringement proceedings are for legislation which was adopted 20 years ago. So we know that we need some time to digest, and we know we need creative solutions. You mentioned creativity. I think creativity is needed everywhere. It's not only the Commission infringement proceedings which will make things happen. So governance um, and um, polluter pace principle, perhaps moving from setting rules to uh, more a market-based instrument. And there we come what you mentioned about uh, the economic system. Um, the recovery um, and resilience plans are a new attempt to link targets and long-term planning to commission funding. Um, we will certainly look to how to make better use of this once we have seen how it works in practice. There are some calls from the environmental community to have a governance, an environmental governance like we have for climate governance. There's absolutely no decision yet, but we see that um, there, there are reflections. At the same time, there's also some risk of going into silos again. Mm. If we have our own beautiful environmental governance, what's mm. with the integration into climate and uh, agriculture? So it's, it's just, uh, we, we just start thinking about it. And uh, implementation also means the um, so many delegated acts on the uh, sustainable product initiative. And there's just one thing I want to mention. I'm I, I'm fully on your side about the elephant in the room, but I think something has changed. The elephant is mentioned now in Brussels. You are allowed to speak about planetary boundary, reducing our absolute footprint. It is the common wording it now in the yeah. Commission. Sufficiency is a bit, uh, bit far. For me, the problem is not anymore the mentioning the elephant, but how quick we want to get the elephant out of the room. So the pace for me is the main challenge. Mm. Sorry, it was a bit no, thank you very much, Cloudy. The elephant isn't invisible. We're just sort of trying to work out how big it is and, and whether we need to knock the wall out of the room. Um, can I, before I go away, I, I just wanted to ask you, we, implementation gap, you mentioned that as well. Are there particular barriers, systemic barriers or generic barriers that you see when it comes to implementation that you, you feel are worth pointing out uh, for, for our audience? Perhaps we should turn to the <laughs> member states here. I mean, one uh, particular barrier will be that the money is getting scarce. Uh, administrative capacities are getting scarce. We hear that the environmental um, authorities have less and less resources in the member states, and this will not get better. But uh, I think the main obstacle is about the, the way how our own, own economic system is still framed. We still put too much money on destroying things, and then we complain that we don't have enough money to, uh, to protect nature. There is, there is some room for coherence improvement. Now, I know you want to come in, but we have a member state representative yeah. here in Norway, yes. and I, I wanted to ask you, in that case, do you see, in terms of implementation, particular challenges uh, for Slovakia or, or more generally uh, for, for the region? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as, as many others, as you are busy with designing the, the laws, we are, of course, overwhelmed by, mm. you know, even taking care that everything is well understood and, and actually put in place so we can um, move ahead. Uh, so, of course, there are many risks uh, associated with the implementation. We were, uh, in my previous uh, talk, we were mentioning the recovery plan. Of course, it was designed to actually mm. Uh, provide and, and rebuild um, the economy uh, after the COVID times, and then the war came and all the all this energy crisis. And that's why a new chapter in <laughs> resilience is coming. But it's very it's very hard <coughs> to cope with all these uh, um, many initiatives, many legislation. I even for the smaller country like Slovakia, it's very hard to to even follow. Um, so there are certainly risks. Uh, associated, but I'm sure that uh, once um, we prioritize, uh, I think we can we, we can we can be better off uh, at the end. 
Uh, but I can uh, say that uh, the, the scarcity, uh, also human scarcity, uh, financial scarcity is, is, is happening in, in certain areas and we need to uh, make it work in a more sustainable um, and long-term perspective. Do you think there's a danger that with this raft of legislative proposals and requirements on member states that, that you know, some, some countries might get a bit left behind when it comes to, to, to implementation and actually making the change on the ground? Absolutely, and we see it as, as now we are experiencing the world with the high inflation and, and rising uh, living costs, as, as we've heard before, <laughs> that you need to have also a solid backing by, by citizens, by companies, by stakeholders, and once people cannot really survive, uh, it's very hard to, to, talk, to talk about the long-term you know, uh, perspective and, and try to maneuver in, in that regard. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, we need to make sure, and this is perhaps for the next phase, uh, perhaps also for post-2024 20, uh, European Green Deal, uh, that we really focus on the social transition, on mm. the social cohesion, mm. on the social part of the things, because people and companies can cope with that for, for longer. Are there, I mean, Slovakia... Um, has gone through an extraordinary transformation in many ways, uh, and you've outlined you know, the, how that is continuing through the National uh, Recovery and Resilience Plan. Are there lessons for, that, that you feel Slovakia has, has learnt through over the last oh, two, two decades or more um, about how to do transitions, how to cope with transformations uh, that you think are worth sort of sharing uh, for other, other countries? Yeah, absolutely. We have a real-time experience coming from the Soviet mm. or communist uh, times, and we have actually uh, perceived and, and went through in the 90s through the collapse of, of the industry, of the regime, so the social mm. impacts were very, very harsh. Uh, and, and of course, we are learning uh, from that, and we are also trying to to work with our neighbors with the Eastern, within the Eastern partnerships, Balkans and, and other, let's say, surrounding countries uh, to learn and, and set up the, the scene in a better way so we avoid those social, uh, uh, negative social implications. So we are working, working on that. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot solve everything. We need to also be coherent and, and cooperative and, 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 and push uh, as a bloc uh, together, uh, even in, 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 in the regional terms. But of course, we are trying to, uh, to, to pass uh, our lessons learned uh, from, from this transformation. And I see it, uh, some similarity with now uh, decarbonizing strategies and, and going, uh, let's say, also resource efficient uh, um, um, around the system that we, we, we can learn from, from, from there are certain similarities. That's why I'm, I'm underscoring this social mm. dimension that we really, ne really need to make sure that nobody is left behind. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Indeed. Janusz, implementation. What did you want to come in and tell us about? No, I, I, I wanted just to say that there is one fundamental thing which we need to understand. On one hand, what decides how we behave, it's, uh, of course, the rules and regulation. But on the other hand, it's actually the major uh, distributive mechanism which we call market. And uh, market, it's actually not sending us in the same direction as the regulation. And the uh, market is telling us it makes more sense if you destroy more, it makes more sense if you consume more. So that's what market is telling us. And basically, we are constantly approaching consumer behave more responsibly and uh, buy things which are more environmentally friendly. But yeah, you have to pay 30, 40% more. Come on. They taught me in economic faculty that you are stupid if you act like that. So, you know, you need to align those things as long as, as environment is simply not, or environmental degradation, it's simply not part of the cost structure. We are where we are. And then, of course, with all the efforts which regulatory bodies are trying to achieve, they try to remedy and bring the public interest into the center. But what they create, it's a lot of confusion on the market and a lot of lobbying of business organization against the changes which they want to introduce, which is logical. So I think it's really, really important that we start working on the market incentives. And it would be particularly important that finance ministers would start to understand what is their role. Their role is not only to keep the budget 
in, in, uh, in balance. But actually to tell producers and consumers with the tax structure, with the levels, what they want we consume more, what they want that we consume more, less. To tax more resources, to tax less labor. To go into direction of that all the public money is used for public purposes. So I've been in, in many governments, including European Commission, where nobody was against that we would uh, remove the, the, the state subsidies and use it not for environmentally harmful purposes. But we have never done that. Why we are not doing that? It's, it's no-brainer. It's no-brainer that we would need to, uh, to close the tax heavens because it's an uh, escape room for rich companies and rich people, and we don't do it. You know, it's so no-brainer. And with that, we basically stabilize the economic system as it is and the interest as it is. And with all the regulation, if we would... For example, if I give you just one example uh, about the refrigerator, because, uh, by the way, uh, uh, if we will not uh, switch this off, uh, I will be like I'm sitting in the refrigerator here. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's an extreme, extremely cold breeze coming from behind it, us. The, Three of us are, <laughs> and the four of us are absolutely freezing on stage. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like, like you would be from freezer talking to you about sustainability. <laughs> so it's... Uh, so, uh, just imagine, uh, because uh, human meat is, of course, uh, cool and safe and healthy food. It's not having a refrigerator at home. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we currently have it, so we own it. So, what is the interest of producer if we own the refrigerator? The interest is selling us as many refrigerators because this is the base on which they create their profit. Correct. Even they are interested that it's hardly repairable, or if it's repairable, that it's cheaper if you buy a new one. And we are many times doing that. And if you would ask anybody who is a bit older between us, we all know that the system 20, 30 years was not exactly like that. But imagine that you would switch the system to something which would be uh, the producer of the refrigerator is the owner till the life Spend and you still have it at home. That it doesn't change anything, but you would pay, for example, 10 euros per month for cooling. So, <laughs> uh, so um, what is the what's actually the consequence of Ooh. that? The consequence is that the refrigerator becomes the cost of the, and actually you create the system in which economics are working in the direction to use less resources which is essential, and you still have the same human needs met, the same, even easier, because having a refrigerator at home and being the owner is just a problem. We all know that. Mm. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's really those kind of shifts, and you can extend it on whatever you wish, mm. this kind of thinking, because the core question we have to answer is how to meet human needs by using less energy and less resources. So IRP, which I'm co-chairing, it's not against developing of, of well-being. Of course, we are. Human, uh, humans will always develop their way. But we are against using more natural resources for that because it is clearly shown that with the growing population, with the growing economic development, this is in contradiction. It will not end up well. What you're describing is a very different business model for many of the, the companies that yeah. Daniel Vestlianas has invited to Stockholm yeah. over the last few days. Yeah. You, you're in, you, I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing idea. Um, Norbert, you, can, can I just say yes. one sentence? Because we have so many times mentioned competitiveness in this room today. <laughs> uh, look to the World Economic Forum 10 top 10 risks, which were released in January this year. If you look to two years span, it, by the way, they are based on the survey among the business makers. If you look to two years, it's a mixed bag. If you look to 10 years, it's all green. Among six first, five are environmental. There is no business success, there is no competitiveness without taking that into consideration. That's what business people are telling us. So, Norbert. You, 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 you mentioned the extraordinary sort of world-class vehicle manufacturing that is now in, in, um, in Slovakia. And uh, Janusz is sort of 
rather challenging the idea that everybody needs to own a car or own a refrigerator. Um, uh, how do you think, how, how would you go about persuading companies that their business model needs to change in order to make sure that we do decouple the economic growth from, from, from our resource use? Is it possible? Mm, I mean, everything could be possibly done, but this is a really a master task. Um, but I think um, I would put it in another perspective. Uh, I think perhaps tackling the same, the same, the same nail. Uh, you know, in, with all the climate and environmental legislation and, and also putting, let's say, circular economy also at the heart uh, of, of the business case, I think this is the way that we need to incentivize uh, and, and, and drive them into the direction to be more, let's say, resource efficient, you know, to, 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 be, to be focused on um, on elements that do not require further exploitation of natural resources, but rather uh, are being more smart and efficient <laughs> in using the existing ones. Um, the same goes um, for, for, for other um, areas, but this is just an example that perhaps what Janesh is, is talking is really a systemic um, uh, change that perhaps is, is definitely required once um, the planet uh, will be, you know, with 10 or even more billion people around. Um, but for the time being, I think uh, what we can make it work in, in, a, in a more effective way is, is, to, is to integrate environmental and, um, yeah, mostly environmental sustainability concerns in, in their business models. Uh, because uh, none of them are, are doing that, uh, and I think there is uh, still enough maneuvering ma making them more efficient in, in resource uh, uh, world, and energy world, materials world, um, and innovation that is actually uh, around those mm. areas. Mm. I, I, I want us to move on quickly, actually, now to, to look at the international dimension, but I think there's a connection here. I mean, in a sense, what we're trying to look for is, is if you like, the sort of the Spotify um, but model. I mean, I used to own loads of CDs, but, you know, no one buys a CD anymore. You can just simply have your subscription to music, your subscription to cooling, your subscription to mobility. So we're looking for these disruptive models. Do you have any examples of this actually being the case? You mentioned the example. You, don't, you, you actually don't know what you do with your CDs at home, correct? There we go. There we go. So you mentioned yourself a very good example. <laughs> That's how we go. So the systems are possible, but of course some, some are introduced uh, by an economic... It's actually how how to meet human need in a more simple way. Mm -hmm. And if I can, via the phone or whatever, get the music and listen it, and I just need a device for even that, not always, to, to listen to it, of course it's easier. And if it's easier, it's easier also to introduce. And it's, by the way, in this case, also cheaper. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a nice model, which is telling you how some of the resource use is getting redundant. Mm -hmm. By the way, I would not be so worried about even uh, it is true that uh, my point is actually that, uh, that it's very important not to look to the interests of car industry, but to look to the interests of consumer and mobility needs. So we need to develop alternative ways of how to meet uh, these needs in the most effective way. And, uh, of course, we will never switch uh, from car to something else mm. if we would not have a good alternative. Mm. That's how, mm. unfortunately, mm. Uh, reality looks like. Mm. But we need to look through the mobility angle. If we don't look through the mobility angle, then we don't get the proper answers. But I'm not worried also of the producers so much because, you know, the population, you are in the country where the population is stable, the population in the world is growing, and there will be definitely, uh, definitely, uh, uh, definitely the, the um, increasing need also for the, uh, for the car manufacturer's production. But the fact, the, the problem is actually, are you producing it in a competitive way or are the others actually surpassing you? So I'm, I'm not so much worried about those things, but the, in the saturated world where we are living, you know, if we, we are, uh, you said that the, the core question is how to get the others on board. You know, if you look through, and it's very telling, if you look to the climate talks, uh, the loss and damage is the major success. But frankly, loss and damage, it's not limiting the, of the warming for a single zero degree. 
but what is with the, with the fact that we have acknowledged the loss and damage, we have actually acknowledged that we, we have more responsibility than the others. And uh, you have only two ways to acknowledge that responsibility. One is either to look your, to your material and consumption footprints and to commit in those NDCs that you will lower them, which would be the best way, because with that you basically address the environmental pressures. The other which is happening is just increasing the, and that's what is currently happening in the talks, that the uh, low-income countries are just increasing their needs, and rightly so, of more and more loss and damage help. So, but uh, fixing, uh, you, you know, um, taking painkillers to fix the chronic diseases normally does not end up well. So uh, the advice is rather to start looking to the, to the medicines for, for chronic diseases. We do need to get the others on board. And in particular, I want to f just ask a quick question to you, all, th all three of you, which is, does it, does it matter internationally the sort of sustainability regulations uh, and the Green Deal directives, does that matter in terms of shifting the international uh, uh, agenda, both in policies but also decisions made in the boardroom and at the kitchen table, as Daniel Wesleyan said? Does it, does it matter, Norbert, do you think? Definitely, it does, it does matter. And of course, Europe needs to be involved and engaged globally. Uh, the situation and, and debate we are having in Europe is, is very unique and it's not happening in other parts of the world or in other countries in that sophisticated manner and way that um, we need to cherish that. And actually, uh, maybe one or two examples. Europe used to be a, a front leader uh, in technological innovation for wind and solar. But unfortunately, uh, we, we cannot scale up those innovations. So I think there are other regions like China uh, or, or United States that are um, now surpassing European Union, which is, uh, of course, very unfortunate. That's why we need to be present, we, we need to be engaged, and we need to use our strength and, and develop those strengths. And I see it in this industrial um, <coughs> greening or um, an area for, for industrial innovations uh, that perhaps Europe could be setting the best uh, and front-leaning examples not to lag behind. So I think we definitely need, we have a super capacity in, in policy and legisla legislation making. I think there is uh, loads of inspiration coming from European Union and we need to uh, make sure that, um, that we remain the, the, the front leader. So I think it's, it's a must oh. for us. We've been talking about the European Green Deal, Claudio, but I mean, is there any discussion within the Commission as seeing the European Green Deal as, you know, having an influence and, uh, on an international stage? Does it, does it actually, does, does it, is it something that is an aim of, 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 of the Commission? It is, uh, the Green Deal is now in the European Green Deal. We have a Green Deal diplomacy. Uh, some of our development funds are linked to the, uh, to the Green Deal. Um, in, we are seen as very active on the, on the UN side, the, the COP, uh, the plastics uh, agreement, the future flex plastic agreement, now the water. Um, I also hear, we have these policy with deforestation and we, uh, we already heard about the carbon adjustment. Sometimes there is some reluctance from other countries who think it's also a way of promoting our own interests. Um, but I think you have more, better view, uh, Janosch, on yeah. the international side <laughs> than yeah. me. No, I, I, I could actually say, this, since I was sitting in two commissions, exactly. European Green Deal was a miracle. And it was a, a real vision. And by the way, the question which you're asking for today's session, can EU become number one exporter of sustainability, sustainability and resilience? It's a totally wrong question. We are. And we are underestimating our position and our impact. And uh, uh, the real question actually is, can we maintain that and can we do everything to implement it at home in our policies and also including in the policies which are linked to our international relations? So to keep this consistency among the policies really through that angle. But don't underestimate uh, the real question. It's really, will we, uh, under the pressure of this current, current development which we have, will we understand that 
keeping and even upgrading the European Green Deal, it's actually at the same time answering also the resilience questions and the stability questions which we are currently dealing in Europe with. Just very quickly, and it's actually related to the current stage of European Green Deal and what I see a little bit missing uh, at the moment, that of course the focus and the shift is towards um, regulating the industry and energy sector, but what I uh, perhaps missing uh, in, that, in that perspective is the focus on the food systems and the, the, the nexus, agri, water, um, and, uh, and food nexus, uh, I think we are sort of uh, losing um, the side and perhaps are not in investing enough attention towards those systems because we can also help uh, in uh, developing uh, world and other countries actually, actually in that regard. So perhaps Brilliant. on that note. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to take I'm two questions from the audience. I can see an eager hand is already raised here at the front. Alessia, could you uh, give the microphone, please, to this lady at the front? It's too warm. Please. Thank you. It's coming behind you. So, a nice, short, crisp question, please. I'm not sure about short and crisp, but I think it needs to be said. Thank you so much. My name is Malani Mehra. Um, I really want to pick up on this uh, theme of today because I absolutely agree with the last speaker, Janos, when you said it's not a question of um, can we, we are. And we have been, I'm Indian, uh, Europe has been for decades. Mm -hmm. And there's so much of the earlier conversation which was about, well, Europe needs to do this, needs to do that. Actually, we are now bearing the fruits of 30 years of proactive leadership on setting the standards for sustainability. 25 years ago, when I started working with Indian business to promote corporate responsibility in India, there was no shortage of Indian entrepreneurs who were eager. Yeah? We have the capacity. What we lacked was the leadership and the governance mechanisms. So what I would like to hear from much more is the way in which we can prime governance readiness to ad address this issue. And Claudia, I loved your answer when you posed the question about what has Europe's response been to the poly crisis? And you said without blinking, it was a mic drop moment. The answer is the European Green Deal. Because that is now so mainstreamed <laughs> It doesn't require any lobbying by anybody to understand that this is the way in which we address the crises of our times. But governance institutions around the world are not of the type in the EU. The EU is miraculously unique because you've got a commission, you've got parliamentary engagement and legitimization through the parliament, you've got citizenship engagement, and you've got the, you've got the, you mentioned it, you've got the infringement mechanisms which make sure that delivery happens. Look at the anomaly. I live in London, very important. You look at what happens when a country peels away from that architecture of governance. We now have a major issue in the UK around sewage in surface water. And this is now becoming an election issue. Why? Because we have let go of the Water Framework Directive, which was the rulemaking set of institutions and the law which governed water quality in the UK. There is no infringement mechanisms. The enforcement agencies are not working. So let's get to the real issue, which is good governance. It was an agenda 20 years ago. We've let go of it. We've become defensive. Other parts of the world are becoming defensive. Let's just be confident about what we're good at and speak with respect to the rest of the world. I would like to see it adopted my, my own country in India. Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't want to take this, you know, take this long, but just wanted to thank you for the work that you're all doing. Thank you. thank you. You bring us back to, to one of, of Janusz's four key messages as well, which was around governance. So Janusz, I just, can you give us a very sort of brief answer as to how we begin to, if you like, not export the rules, but rather export the model of, of, of governance uh, that, that we have in the EU that, allow, that enables these sorts of sustainability transitions to happen? That's difficult to say. In my own area, I just know that because you mentioned, for example, that uh, there is a global agreement on plastic and so on. And the only thing which I don't agree with you about the plastic, it's actually started in my mandate. So the first legislation yes. on plastics was adopted, single-use plastic back, and it was the first legislation going against the internal market rules at that time, which was great. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, really, uh, we would need something more... Uh, uh, more um, on international level to deal with uh, resource management. 
we simply don't have it. We have a convention on, on we have a convention on impacts. We have zero practically conventions which are serious on drivers and pressures. And the the resource story, it's pretty much in, in the essence of everything what is happening. Mm. Uh, but uh, but I think if you look at it from uh, politically wise, we all see that the Western world is quite seriously challenged and that we will have to look into the mirror also a bit. Uh, thank you very much uh, to my panel. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, we're going to say goodbye to our online audience. Thank you very much for, for being with us. And I would like to invite you to give a round of applause to this fantastic panel. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>